information. So that's not a thesis, it's a statement of fact. And the other statement of fact is they don't do it. Yeah. They provide spin and public relations. 99% yeah. of the information that comes out of there is biased information designed to have you adopt a particular perspective. Yeah, I think this happens across the board, um, at all levels of governments. Uh, and in Victoria, it, it happens to some extent. But I think we have to be able to understand that there are an there's an organization there, right? With a leader, with, with uh, a city manager, with a council that says, this is what we're recommending, right? Now the initiative came along for the bridge, and many people are divided on this issue, but the initiative came along and essentially required this <coughs> to be debated, right? So to say that the city wouldn't have a position, I don't know if that's... No, I'm not, I'm not saying the city, the city has a very clear position. Yeah. Vote yes. That's their position. But their policy says that they promise to provide information on both sides, balanced information. And they don't. They provide their piece, their perspective. So lastly, you know, you have a... How do we fight, how do we fight the PR and spin machine? Um, well, I think that's why citizens have to get involved in one way or another as early in the process as possible. Now, with the bridge, it wasn't really possible because the first thing we heard about it, basically, was the councillors in 2009 decided to sure. replace the bridge. Yeah, there wasn't exactly. any real debate. No. So the council had already, and the staff probably, had already decided. So somehow we have to make it known to our political bodies that we want to be involved in the decision before they make the decision. So you just have to keep making that point again and again. And I, I, I think uh, what Kitimat did recently was really interesting on the, um, the uh, Enbridge pipeline. They held a plebiscite to see what their citizens actually wanted. So with, you know, if we hear some kind of, get some kind of inkling that there's another big project coming up, we should be demanding a plebiscite before it gets decided so that the, the information then is balanced. We have this plebiscite and at least the city council has direction from, you know, anybody who wanted to go out and vote. Um, the other thing I think is that you do have to support your local journalists, <laughs> the media that are trying to get the fair and balanced <coughs> information out there, or the other side of the story. Do I remember correctly that that plebiscite was almost evenly balanced? Wasn't it 55, 45, something like that? 58.4 percent voted um, against the pipeline. In, in, in Kitimat? In Kitimat. Yes. And 62 percent came out to vote. Yeah, it was interesting wow. after, after that plebiscite, and, and last week or, or recently, they vote in favor of David Black's mm -hmm. yeah. uh, refinery. But when they were asked, the why didn't you have a plebiscite? They said, um, when David Black spoke in Kitimat at council, everyone in the room was in favor, which I thought was, um, I was going to tell David Black, that was a brilliant move. If I can just, John, if I can just speak up to that. Chain of newspapers yeah. That's right. Yeah. Um, just in terms of public engagement, uh, accuracy of information, and uh, you know, what is the right form of getting public involved into policies and, and decision making, there are two strikingly uh, different examples that came out of the provincial government this year. One is in relation to um, the reforms to the Liquor Act, where they had eight months of open open information and consultation across the province, seeking ideas from the public. It was their, I mean, kudos and credit to them. They had 15,000 full-on applications from all kinds of organizations and individuals with great ideas about how to reform this 50-year-old act. Contrast that with what they did with the BC Ferries, which is they made a decision and then went out and said, now we're going to engage the public, right? So it's, you know, governments will play with this game as where they can see an advantage. They know the Liquor Act is, is a soft thing, right? There's not that many teeth, 
that many teetotalers left in British Columbia. We have the highest alcohol consumption rate in Canada. All right, so they, that's a set group for them. And it's, it's going to, at the end of the day, be a good news story. They, they, they knew that. BC Ferries, on the other hand, is always going to be bad news for them. So they had to turn it around and do it the opposite way. And same thing with the ALR. And with ALR and the Parks Act. Yeah. Yeah. Go, going back to your question, John, I think it's the difference. I mean, when I first was elected, um, there were no communications, public relations departments. Um, the mayor had to do, that was part of his job until the day I left office. That was still part of the mayor's job in the jurisdiction I was in. Um, each, each municipality does it different. And like when I was chair of the CRD, that was certainly. I was very unused to having other people speak for, for, for if you like, the organization. And, and it becomes not a communication department, it becomes a public relations department. Yeah, that's, 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 that's the trouble with what you're trying to look for, that difference. And it's, it's interesting, the mayor of Saanich, still, which is a municipality bigger than the city of Victoria, still is the only communicator. If you, if you look at Saanich, it's always the mayor of San Andreas speaks. There is no communications department. Uh, so um, I, I want to comment further on that because uh, you know we've been talking. Oh, uh, one of the things uh, we've been talking about how uh, government information comes to us, um, but uh, I think the other part of it is uh, how our information, our input, actually goes to them. And of course, they want to gain the system so that uh, they hear as little from us as possible, or they uh, do things where oh, there's going to be a meeting, um, it's going to be you know, 7 o'clock, this is where it is, it's on a Saturday, nobody's going to show up, they know that. And so, so they make public engagement in a way that no one or very few people are actually going to. And then they can say, well, this is just a few troublemakers and uh, that kind of thing. So, uh, and the other side of it is when they do open it up, even with, uh, as you were saying, with the, um, with the uh, liquor uh, uh, with the problems, uh, you, you end up getting individual responses this way, but it's just, you kind of send it off into the void, and, and what happened to it, did they, did they, did they shred them, did they look at them, um, and uh, so, uh, I, I think one of the things that we need, because we're move, hopefully moving into a, an era of uh, open data, uh, is then uh, we need to be able to take that data and, uh, first of all, have tools to be able to analyze that data online, really accessible, um, sort of the Wolfram Alpha kind of thing, uh, but also uh, to be able to have some sort of, hopefully third party, I don't trust the government to manage, uh, some sort of uh, uh, um, policy creation uh, uh, um, crowdsourcing wiki uh, kind of a system where you uh, can, uh, you know, when you get the data, it's like, oh, we're going to build a bridge. Uh, well, well, uh, now all the engineers in the city can take a look at that information and start like just talking to each other, but also start building um, public policy because you can go through it in a, in a pattern language kind of way and say, well, okay, what is it? There needs a solution. Uh, you know, is there any blowback? Is there, you know. Um, you know, who's this going to disadvantage, who's advantaged by it, and, and all those different things. And it will allow for, like with the sewage treatment, you know, with the right plan, that there's actually, yeah, there's actually, but there's actually an alternative. It's not like, well, I don't like what you're doing, but there's, there is no alternative. You need to be able to allow, help the public to, uh, to create documents, not just a, an endless list of opinions, but where people actually work together to create a policy so that you can say, well, this is what we want. I mean, even if that policy gets, you know, like GitHub and forked so that there's multiple opinions about it, at least you're coming with large numbers of people who have an opinion. So it comes to the politicians rather like a, uh, a political, uh, uh, you know, can you, can you put that into a question? Put that into a question. <laughs> Okay, just, just so the rest. Uh, uh, oh, oh, sorry, uh, 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 what, do you, what do you think about the idea of uh, having some sort of uh, third party, perhaps Open Victoria, uh, 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 wiki page where people can start working on policy together, uh, you know, in a in a uh, controlled and uh, efficient and um, cohesive kind of manner? 
Okay. Um, so I'm going to try to make this one. Okay. Um, <laughs> so you, you brought up GitHub, and uh, I'm a developer, so I get that. Uh, for the people in the room who have no idea what GitHub is, um, it's a programming tool that developers and, and people who work in computer programs use to collaborate on software development. Um, it's a really cool tool. They manage to socialize the ability to create changes in something you don't own. So a document or a wiki gets really hard to manage because you have to manage who edits it. But GitHub is this concept of something called a pull request, which is that anybody, anywhere can create a change set, some kind of modification onto the, whatever the existing is, and say, hey, I want to merge this in. And then they can get other people in the community to vote, you know, plus one, plus one, plus one. And it ends up with the ability for the owner of that document, say the municipality or whatever it is, to say, yes, I think there's enough support for this, I think this is a good change, <coughs> merge in. And it keeps that authority, but it also gives that opportunity for participation. So this is one of the things the Open Data Society BC has been arguing for for quite some time. Get the public service into GitHub. Get them doing this model. Good. Okay. Let me, David, I, I want to make the point about how complicated some of these matters are. Not exactly what you're talking about. A pal of mine shared the Site C Review Committee up on the Peace River, Fort St. John. I've downloaded the report. It's four or five hundred pages. It's Solomonic in character. They said on the one hand this, on the other on the hand that. I mean. They've been talking, I've only lived here 21 years, they've been talking about this for 40 or 50 or 60 years, they may be talking about it for another 20 or 30 years, and I think that that report in another environmental review that was done recently, lay before us, if we're willing to read it, the complexities of these matters from a financial environmental point of view. As far as I know from chatting with my pal, they think that BC Hydro's economic forecasts are highly skeptical. But on the environmental stuff, they seem to, there seems to be intelligent material there. So. For any of us to sit down, imagine if I was a professor, pretend I'm a professor, I'm going to assign you all, we're going to meet here tomorrow night, we're going to discuss sight C and see what we think about it. But we'd, we'd have really hard, firm material to go meet, and then we put our lenses on. We might we put an environmental lens or a financial lens or a taxpayer's lens, and we come into a decision. So I think having that kind of material available and downloadable from the Globe and Mail is brilliant. Okay, just a quick, quick comment on that. Um, this is something that's um, being discussed at some levels within the provincial government because one thing that I think everybody agrees on is a general lack of trust uh, in at all levels of government. Yep. And how are we going to build that, that trust so that we can we feel confident that when we elect somebody, they are going to represent us and think wisely and critically on the issues that come before them, what kind of policies they're going to vote for, that kind of thing. So. Public engagement and participation is absolutely vital in this. And just to tag on to what David was saying there, yes, issues are really complicated. I don't think I, in, in the one year, by its one year tomorrow since Andrew Weaver got elected, in that, in that year, I don't think we've come across one issue which doesn't have some shade of gray in it. Right? And it's really, really important that anybody who's looking at that actually has the right kind of information in front of them to make a valued judgment. On, on what's happening. And also, so the elected uh, official has the confidence in going in front of the public, in front of the constituents, and say, this is how I came to this conclusion. This is why I voted this way. Here's the information that actually served that judgment. On the other side of it, uh, if you're dealing with something like Kinder Morgan, um, anybody want to go through 15,000 pages of technical data? <laughs> <laughs> that's what our office is doing right now. It's, it's a complex issue. Yeah. Right. Well, of course, uh, you know, I mean, that's why you send it up to the general public that's because right. there is somebody who would love to go through 15,000 yep. pages of technical data. In fact, there's probably 10 people who want to do that very kind of thing. Free. Uh, for free. Mm -hmm. And also, when, you know, a minister or a counselor is, is making some decision based on what staff consider and what engineers they have, well, there's other people within the community who maybe have a, a, different, a difference of opinion or maybe more specialized information, uh, which they can give to the city for free to the public as a public service. We can all uh, give our expertise to, to the public uh, good. And, and, so, and so it's, it's not necessarily just about challenging the, the status quo or challenging the government, but actually enhancing it through, uh, through this kind of crowdsourcing. I, I completely agree with you, absolutely. Okay. 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 Yep. Go ahead. My name is Victoria. I'm just wondering, um, I think it's really important that we get our data out there. 
quote, the rule by nobody, the most autocratic of all political tyrannies, a lattice work of bureaucracy in which no men, neither one nor the best, neither the few nor the many, can be held responsible. To me, it's a very profound uh, indictment, I think, of our social uh, way of trying to arrive at decisions and almost what she calls the banality of evil. So my, I, I know I've taken it to an extreme here, but what I am asking is, where is the accountability? Where is the accountability uh, from the electorate's point of view to those whom we elect and the people who work in these bureaucracies? Because it seems to me that we give very short shrift to accountability. Okay. Matt, why don't you, why don't you, do you want to handle both? Both from, <laughs> well, there's an accountability yeah. from the elected people, and then there's accountability from uh, civil servants. Public uh, service. Yes, and there are, although they can be obscure, and they're different at various levels of government, there are accountability standards um, in the way that especially information is treated. Um, which are being tightened up, not enough in my view, but are, are happening um, as we speak now. I'll, I'll, I'll give you one example, and, and David mentioned this in his uh, opening preamble. There is procedures being put in place so that communication chains are actually happening, because what happened uh, just before the election, it was called the um, uh, quick wing scandal. There were people up in the Premier's office who were using their private emails uh, to share information and, and to put together this sort of policy package and, and avoiding their, their own official emails because they knew that that could be FOI, right? Um, that theoretically cannot happen anymore, although I can tell you specifically that it actually does because we don't have the actual procedures of people being able to say, listen, I need to ensure that everything you're doing while you're on work time and uh, to do something that's work-related is actually happening in, in the right platform and through the right procedures. So that's something that I think really has to be worked on. Um, the other side of the accountability too is, um, and this ties into uh, what this gentleman was saying and what um, uh, Kevin was saying as well. I think the more that the public is involved in sharing and gathering of information and participating in, in public life, the, the greater the accountability, because often we won't have the questions. We won't be able to, you know, see the gaps in what's happening. Uh, it'll be you out there who are able to say, hey, what's, <coughs> something's fishy is going on here, or could you explain that? And that might act, actually expose something. So I, 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 I firmly believe in developing these kind of um, processes, procedures, and platforms that actually allow for greater participation uh, uh, between the elect, between the bureaucracy uh, and the public. Anyone else like to comment on that? Yeah, I'm mm -hmm. going to say something, perhaps read this. I'm an academic by background, I'm actually an historian. <coughs> and uh, I value expertise, and I'm a consultant, and people pay me for my opinion, and they pay me a lot by the hour, so they tend to listen to what I have to say. And so I expect engineers, consultants, experts, at, millions of things that are going on in our society, or even top public servants who are in the environment and whatever else it is, are worth some deference. And a member of parliament like Andrew Weaver, I'd like to I should say, has got academic expertise. That's one of the reasons I voted for him. I expect him to bring some sophistication. Although I suspect in the first year, as you've reflected, he's realized how complicated these issues are. And as an academic, he might have thought some of them were black and white, but they're not so black and white anymore. So. We, we have to, you know, I, I expect a plumber or a designer or a restaurant, first my chef, you know, to know what the hell they're doing and not keep me safe, food safe, for example, or work safe. So, so I just don't see where all, we're going to have a system where we're all going to be pushing <coughs> buttons on every decision in our society. That would be a recipe for, I hope I'm not around and that's how it happens. So there's one of the issues, I'll put this to the panel, one of the issues uh, in local government, CRD, local regional government, is one of the issues that the city of Victoria as a whole is changing. 
It's going from a small little city to a medium-sized city. And is, is this one of the issues that is driving this lack of trust? Because everything is becoming much more complicated and there's all these gray areas and we're moving to, I mean, it doesn't matter whether you look at garbage systems, whether you look at water systems, whether you look at sewage systems, they're all going from small city size to big city size. It's like a company, a corporation, that is trying to grow. And the question is whether you have the right directors running the corporation for a different type of corporation. I'll, I'll throw it out to you. So, yes, there is a problem in the fact that we are growing in that way. Um, but I think it's broader than that. I think it's that we have these very complicated lobbying structures set up. Throughout BC, throughout the federal government, especially, that basically push an agenda or push a direction, and then our politicians respond to that because there's perception that those <coughs> control voters and so on and so forth. I think personally, the only solution to this is that you inform each citizen with as much data as they want to be able to get their hands on, and they can or cannot review it. They can talk with their policy networks and their leaders, like you know, we have good civil leaders in the tech movement, um, who then can go in and talk to politicians and make that work. Um, I think those things are all informed by having primary source data so that we can look at the same information you're looking at and say, yeah, I think you made the right decision there. Mm -hmm. yeah, look at, let me give you an example. I'm thinking of Barack Obama, the IT leaders of Google and so forth, went to meet with them about surveillance and how it's hurting their business with the cloud and all the rest of it all over the world. Barack Obama has to pay attention to 30,000 people who work for the National Security Agency. A massive bureaucracy. Some of the news today from Snowden leaks was that perhaps every computer made in the United States has some kind of bug in it. You know, that's a big deal. That is a big deal. And so, even though the American economic interest globally is at stake here, Obama's going to be much more uh, preventing 9 11 is a big thing for him. And if you think of the power of that 30,000 national security agency people, plus the entire FBI and the military, you know, it's massive. All the contractors. No. Huge. Sorry. Now, the contract. Let's see. You want to comment on Just let me say the contractor that, that worked for that Snowden worked for wasn't even sophisticated enough to catch him at what he was doing. <laughs> so these are the people looking after us. Um, I think it, we are, you know, bigger and more complicated, and I do think technology has made it more complicated as well as more um, things should be more accessible. And so, um, but yeah, I think through things like, now that we have the technologies, developing the open data, and um, I think we'll still need FOIs because from what I can see, just, um, there's a lot of interpretation, there's a lot of, um, you know, analysis that goes into uh, understanding an issue. I mean, David Broadland can spend weeks, you know, getting a story figured out because he goes to the original reports and he notices that there's discrepancies and he has to trace those down and so on. So it's, um, but the, the more uh, transparent we can be, and uh, this comes back to the accountability question that the lady back there asked. Um, when we're doing a report too, we're trying to be, um, as clear and thorough as possible, and that means um, we sometimes like to name names. And of course that means we have to be really, really accurate, and often run it by a lawyer um, to make sure we, you know, we're covered, we're not going to be sued because of it. But we do think it is important for accountability to talk about the individual players from time to time. Because they are, they are part of our governance, both staff and council. So, Chris, you have a couple more questions. Good one, Ian. I'm one of the directors of Open Victoria. I wanted to ask a two-parter. Um, I wanted to applaud everyone for being here, and I wanted to ask the first question to uh, Kevin, because a lot of people don't know about this. If you could talk to the idea of Hacks, hack camps, and sprites and sprints, and sort of uh, talk about how it could actually benefit uh, the process of FOIs and open data sharing and coalition building among a 
class groups here. I'd also like to ask everyone what you would think about where's the best place to find right now a template or a talk or a discussion or an online resource for learning about how to actually conduct an FOI, develop an FOI, work with lawyers, work with people in that. Thank you. <laughs> okay, um, so the hackathon process, uh, this is great. So I think what the media does with the word hacker is, is really a disservice. Um, so there's, there's kind of a differentiation. If most people hear the word hacker and they don't know the tech community, they think, you know, an evil guy is breaking into computer systems. Uh, the reality of the word is as much uh, simpler. It's a person who likes to create things. It's a person who likes to take something that isn't supposed to be done and do it anyways. And this could be as simple as, you know, uh, taking some data and turning it into a civic app like to remind you about garbage. That would be considered hacking. Um, and so in this case, we, we have is, the Open Data Society is a group of citizens, just like anybody in this room. And we set together to get a room, just somebody's donated, and put a whole bunch of people in it. And they don't have to be programmers, uh, they can be people who can read PDFs and select out information. Uh, and we pair them up with programmers and technology people to create web applications, to crowdsource ideas, to do all this kind of stuff. Uh, and so the hackathon process has been really successful in BC. We've produced I don't know, 50 or 60 applications. Uh, done analysis from municipal debt to municipal taxes across all the municipalities in BC. Uh, I'm involved in doing this, this infrastructure data uh, hacking. So that's all really useful, and I think Abby's, uh, thank you for pointing that out. Uh, as to, so the second part of your question was? Kevin, the second part was about uh, getting FOIs. How did you get Okay. And I think Leslie, actually, you, you mentioned that you would, you would tell people. Well, it's, it's easy, basically. Um, I think the hard part is just figuring out what, what information you want, how to describe it. So if you know it's a certain report, because you've heard this report was done and you can't find it on the website, I mean, first you would ask where, where you could find this kind of information without going through FOI. Um, and then if they say it's only available through FOI, you um, put in your subject line, uh, freedom of information request and send it to the anybody at that government, CRD or the, the uh, city. Um, and then you might need a little patience and a little persistence. If they um, say it doesn't exist or it's going to be delayed, you can you know, um, cite their duty to assist. I mean, it is our information and they do have a duty to assist you in finding that information. Um, they might uh, cite solicitor client, well they might block, give it to you and redact a bunch of sections and then you have to um, find out what those sections relate to and it's usually something like solicitor client privilege or um, it would somehow affect a third party negatively or the corporation of the city of Victoria itself. It's a business interest. So, um, but you can appeal all of those things through the OIPC if you feel like it's really important information. It's in the public interest. You have a right to take it further. Yeah. David. You just have to keep appealing and it doesn't cost you anything. No, and then the, the Office of the Information Privacy, Privacy Commissioner mediates 90 to 95% of it. They become the specialists, have conversations. Here's from the Ministry of the Environment, I'm from the Privacy Commission's office. We go back and forth yeah. and get settled. We, there are excellent websites. The BC Information Privacy Commissioner has a very good website about privacy protection, and there's more there than you could ever read in a lifetime on all the hot issues she's dealing with, <coughs> FOI and privacy. She's frustrated, too, by difficulties of dealing with our government. Her workload is up 35% this year. She has 35 people working for her, okay? There are 120 in the central government. Shows you what, and there's 30,000 public servants or something in this province. Um, BC Free Information Privacy Association, it's like Monday Magazine used to be. Daryl Evans founded it, and Daryl Evans and has got a successor now whose name escapes me. I'm sorry. Vincent Gogolak. Vincent Gogolak, thank you. And they've got BC FIPA, it's a, like Open Victoria, and they've got lots of guides about how to do things, and they've been long time good users of the legislation. Okay.
Russ, I think uh, probably going to give yeah. you the final question. And uh, the discussion will go to Kevin. Um, it's context says the, the theory of open data sounds really good, uh, but data can be, comes in all forms. How uh, how intensive and how big a job would it be to standardize a format that that data would be presented in so it's usable? And uh, how do you ensure the integrity of that data? Really good question. Um, so there is something called the Open Data Usability Index. Uh, this basically sits down a bunch of criteria, as in if it's machine readable, as if it's in a defined format, if it's in, uh, for a number of criteria. And then it tries to come up with kind of a score for this. And this is kind of a number that we give back to municipalities or to data producers and say, this is good quality data or this is bad quality data. As to how do you ensure the format or how do you just pick one, uh, there are international standards. So for municipal data, um, for municipal financial data, I'm, I strongly advocate for the IFRS, the International Financial Reporting uh, System, or specification. And that data set is, is open, extensible format, it's something that's common across all the things, and you can't do things like, I want to put a top category called West Shore. Like, it doesn't allow for that. Um, how do we get people to adopt those things? Well, citizens have to ask for it. They have to ask for this data in a format, and then hopefully somebody can produce it. How do you obtain the accountability? More eyes, more people looking at it. People say, this is nonsense, this isn't real data, this is wrong, this is whatever. And then they submit patches or changes back. OK, we've got time for one more. That's a quick answer. Anyone else? Okay. We've got time for one more question. And if not, Derry's going to finish up with the... Is that one over there? Yep. Let me just go over to Richard. Okay, you, said was, you said it was French wine there? Yes, it is. One more question. <laughs> You have to be here to win it or not? <laughs> no. No? No? You put money in, no questions asked. This has been really great. I've had so many questions. But uh, what John was showing earlier with the card from the city of Victoria telling you how to vote on the bridge reminded me of the sewage referendum that Regina had in the summertime. And the uh, mayor was taken to task because the administrator had gone and basically green-lighted this huge PR campaign during the referendum, and it was the mayor that ended up doing the robocalls, while at the same time he was making excuses to say that, well, the administrator chose to do this campaign, it was done with the public money, and uh, he had nothing to do with it, but he was clearly participating in it, and he had billboards telling him how to vote. So, I, I guess that was uh, related to the question that was asked earlier, is uh, how do you get that level of accountability with the staff? that we seem to need, I mean, we can replace the politicians at election time, but the staff tend to be perennial. And it has a huge impact on the outcome. Mm -hmm. You have to have very, very rigid guidelines in terms of reference and job descriptions around every single staff position. And especially at the municipal level, there isn't a set protocol or procedure or even, you know, guideline book uh, that comes along with the community charter, which actually defines those kind of aspects to say your city manager, your chief engineer, or anything else. If that's left up to each individual municipality about how the staff are actually managed and judged on their actions. Whether that's a good or bad thing, um, I think if you've got a great mayor like Christopher was, uh, who had a great staff with him, and he's able to reward, but also, you know, he must have had occasions where he said, oh, we might have to do things differently here. Uh, that's one thing. And if you get into a situation in a municipality where there isn't good leadership, and there isn't good accountability, then things, I think, can slide backwards very, very quickly. And you end up with situations like uh, Regina. I think both federally and provincially in the last 20 years, political leadership has emasculated the public service, period, yeah. full stop. And it's extremely difficult to be a successful public servant anymore. Is that, David, because the relationship has changed so much with that emasculation? <coughs> You know, the great days of the public service in Canada, when it originated, was the 1930s, 40s, 50s, even in the 60s. And there was a sense of public service, there was an, an, an understanding of the role of the public servant as opposed to the role of the politician. And that has been so uh, destroyed that we don't have the kind of public service we used to have. People would like to be, but they don't dare put their head out of the parapet and be shut yeah. off. Yeah. That's certainly true in British Columbia. And I, I think... I think it, it probably started at the federal level and has now gone down to the municipal and, and the regional level as well. 
So uh, I'll comment on this. Um, there seems to be a lot of call I'm hearing tonight uh, for equality in any kind of discussion like this. Um, that the city or that an organization shouldn't be inherently biased. Um, but I think that reflects the fact that we elect these people to run these organizations, that we, they have an idea of what they want to do, a vision they want to put forward. They're going to have a bias. You couldn't get them not to. So I think it's okay for them to say, you know, we're recommending you vote this and then have this accountability mechanism like the Initiative Act that says, but if you don't like what we're recommending, you can override us. Here's how. And so I don't think we have to come from a position of inherent unbiased beginnings. Uh, I don't think that's fair to the fact that we've elected these representatives as experts to represent our views and then push that agenda forward. Hold it, hold it. Any idea that politicians are experts is <laughs> <laughs> Okay, always, always good to end on a, a controversial <laughs> It's been a very good panel discussion. Uh, Leslie, Matt, Kevin, Dave, thanks. Uh, you, you, you've each brought tonight a uh, perspective from, from both your experiences with what you do, but also throughout of it. I think you can tell these four people they actually love Victoria and they want the best for Victoria. And it's great to have a panel such as this and to moderate it. Thanks very much. Well, thank you very much, and especially to you, Chris, a wonderful job moderating. Great job. Thank you, panel. One of the best discussions I've ever on any topic in a long time. So, one last thing. Who wants a bottle of wine? <laughs> <laughs> so, the uh, bosses in the back, along with the questions.